So this is my first time introducing somebody. This is a new experience for me, and, and Deidre confirmed that it should take about 20, 25 minutes to get through the introduction. I'm, I'm delighted to join with you today, uh, especially for this particular session. Uh, in, in an era when we've diminished and cheapened words uh, just by their overuse, uh, this one's brilliant, that one's brilliant, uh, I think that our presenter today uh, really does fit into the category of that handful of, of icons uh, within Canadian jury. Uh, so I'm, I'm especially delighted uh, to be able to be associated with this session. Uh, first and foremost, a historian uh, and a scholar. Uh, Irving Abella uh, is the Schiff uh, the Schiff uh, professor at, at York University for Canadian uh, Jewish history. Uh, he also is an authority on the Canadian labor movement, and I suspect that there's some connection between the two in terms of, of the Jewish experience and the labor movement over, over uh, the 20th century. Uh, when, however, we, we turn to the focus of today, uh, uh, his work, uh, a seminal work, uh, on uh, one element of the Holocaust, uh, none is too many. Uh, I think that there are lessons that we derive from that book. And for me, uh, there are three that are, are central uh, to life today. Uh, the first uh, is that contrary to what's in vogue, uh, the notion of moral relativism, there is such a thing as objective truth. And that we ought not to allow subjective narratives to replace a proper accounting of the historical record. And that's one of the uh, values that None Is Too Many offers to everybody, both in a particular sense with respect to the Holocaust at a time when we still have to confront Holocaust denial, but as well generically when we look and struggle with trying to navigate through all these narratives to get to the truth. The second, I think, is important lesson that comes out of this book is that there is a notion of collective responsibility. That while it is tempting to lay at the doorstep of the Nazi regime and its collaborators responsibility for the Holocaust, there is a dimension that speaks to the collective responsibility of the international community. And for those, like Canada, that closed their doors and didn't offer a solution, the book comes forward to tell us that there is this concept of the collective having to engage in initiatives and responses that address particular challenges and threats to different communities in different parts of the world. And the third, I think, lesson from this is, is that in its truest sense, history is valuable not just because it captures the past, but because it informs the future. And I just want to share with you one particular insight in why this book is so important. And for me, above all the other achievements that Irving Abella uh, has experienced in his life, I think his true legacy is in the following. Many of you will recall that in the 70s, uh, the international community uh, was faced with a dilemma about the Vietnamese boat people. Israel, I'm proud to say, was one of the first countries to receive 1,000 boat people. I remember the number well uh, during a time when it was uh, faced with its own challenges. But as they were making their way across the Atlantic and approaching the Canadian shore, the Canadian Minister of Immigration at the time, Ron Atke, was faced with competing demands. There were those who were calling for Canada to admit these helpless refugees that were approaching the Canadian shore. But he notes in, in his uh, memoirs that there was a much lar larger and louder voice arguing for Canada to turn its back and shut its door. At the same time, he received uh, some advanced chapters of, of the book, None is Too Many. Uh, 
And it was after reviewing those chapters that he said um, he cannot repeat the mistakes of the past. And it was what propelled him to make Canada a welcome and safe harbor for the Vietnamese boat people. So whether it's about the personal legacy or the power of the historical record and the true ability to, uh, to take heed to, what was it George Santana that talked about those that forget history are doomed to repeat it? Canada didn't repeat it. None is too many is the reason why. And I'm delighted to join you in welcoming Professor Irving Abella. Thank you, Shimon. Um, I think you have a career as, a, as an introducer. Um, however, Shimon just gave away much of my talk, so uh, <laughs> um, I regret that I will be leaving very shortly because I have not. Um, thanks for the introduction, and I am delighted to have been invited to talk to you this afternoon about the writing of None Is Too Many. None Is Too Many began totally by accident. I had a student, a PhD student at York, graduated, couldn't get a job as a historian, so went to work for the archives. Um, and as was his wont, he would from time to time send me plain brown envelopes with what he thought would be information, titling information, all sorts of um, historical discoveries that he thought might interest me. He was my deep throat. And one morning in, um, I think, 1979, I got a plain brown envelope, um, which I was used to getting, but usually with material that I wasn't terribly interested in, uh, that, complained that, that contained two documents. One was a document from the newly accessioned Immigration Department papers, um, it was dated June 4th, 1939, and it read very simply, please take us in. You are our last hope. If you say no, you will be signing our death warrant. And it was signed, the passengers of the ship St. Louis at sea. This was, of course, the infamous voyage of the damned, the boat full of approximately 950 German Jews, robbed of everything they owned, properties, bank accounts, citizenship, passports. The only thing they had of any value was an entry visa to Cuba. The Germans had put the world to a test to see if anyone would accept these Jews, uh, knowing full well the response and understanding that if the world would not react, then Germany was free to deal with its Jews in the way it wanted. And so this boat arrives in Havana, and of course the, the Cuban government changes its mind, it's a new Cuban government, um, and the ship sets sail, forced out of Cuba, and uh, sets sail looking for a haven. It applies, it, it sends cables to every country along the Atlantic coast, South America, and North America. The Americans respond by sending out a Coast Guard vessel to make sure that the boat did not get close enough to American shores for a passenger to slip overboard and swim to safety. And the second document was a document I knew nothing about and no one else knew anything about. It was the response of the Canadian government to this original telegram. And the Canadian government response was, we regret that no country can open its doors wide enough to take in the hundreds and thousands of Jewish people who want to leave Germany. The line must be drawn somewhere. Permission to land refused. So the line drawn, the passenger ships, ship St. Louis, its hopes extinguished headed back to Europe, where many of the passengers would die in the Holocaust, would be murdered in the Holocaust. This was the first time that I, a Canadian historian for some time, had heard anything about 
the government of Canada and the Jews of Europe had heard anything about the government of Canada and um, Jewish refugees. Um, it shocked me to get those two documents. Um, had Canada really been so cold-hearted? And if it had treated the passengers of the ship St. Louis as cruelly and as um, mean-spiritedly as it did, how did it treat the other Jews of Europe? So with my colleague Hesh Troper, we began looking around and, and looking for materials. And there are thousands of books and articles about Canada at that time, about Canada in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Books about the war, about the depression, about the rise of third parties, about farm movements, but not a word anywhere about the Jews. Not a word anywhere about refugees. And so, not knowing whether there was a story or not, we headed off to Ottawa to see what we could discover, to see if the archives had any information. And what we discovered, of course, shocked us, as it shocked many Canadians. Many of us are Canadians, and, and fortunate to be so. We are proud of our heritage, of our traditions, of our myths. And if there is a pervasive Canadian myth, one that most of you grew up with, one that I grew up with, it is a Canada is a country of immigrants, a country with a long history of welcoming refugees and dissidents, of always being in the forefront of accepting those proverbial huddled masses yearning to be free. We believed and were taught to believe and were told by our politicians and teacher that racism and bigotry were European or at least American in origin that have little part of Canadian history and play no role in our psyche. Canada, we were told over and over again, is a vast open country of immeasurable wealth, a country that has always been open to refugees and immigrants. Yet a look at a spate of, of recent books about how our government behaved in various incidents regarding immigrants and refugees, particularly at the time when the Jews of Europe were looking for salvation, I think punctures a hole in this myth. Canadians can no longer sit smugly in judgment of others without taking into account their own record. And that record, of course, during the crisis of the 1930s and 40s, when hundreds, and hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of doomed Jews we're looking for a haven is execrable. The Canadian government, as you know, from none is too many, let all governments, every democracy and every immigration country in the world, in closing its doors to the desperate Jews of Europe. Our record stands alone. So we didn't know that story. We didn't know when we went to Ottawa what we would find. We didn't even know if there was a story. Um, after all, it was 1980, 35 years after the war was over, and no one had written about Canada's record. No one had looked into the matter of, of refugees, and there had to be a reason why. Uh, so maybe there wasn't a story. And one of the things I did was look at the immigration handbook that was passed out to new immigrants who came to Canada uh, up until the appearance of None is Too Many. And there was a paragraph about the Holocaust in which it said something to the effect that when war, before war broke out and the situation of German and Austrian and European Jews became parlous, the government of Canada stepped forward and accepted these, many of these refugees who had come to Canada, work hard, and accomplish a great deal. That paragraph was removed once none is too many came out. So it's, it's a different story. So we didn't know that. We uh, went to the archives and you know when you go to the archives to do research you can't say okay show me the room where you keep the stuff about the Jews. Where, where, where is the material on anti-semitism? Um, you have to start somewhere and uh, we 
um, assumed that this was basically an immigration problem, so he asked for the records of the Department of Immigration. This was before computerization. Um, you couldn't press a button and get the Department of Immigration materials. You couldn't go online. Uh, what they had were finding aids, but the finding aids were each maybe a thousand pages long because they included passenger lists of ships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, we went looking through the immigration records, and uh, I found an entry that, that said Jewish refugees. Okay? So I handed in a slip to the archivist saying I want to see the stuff on Jewish refugees, and it could have been about the Soviet Jewish refugees, about refugees from Romania at the turn of the century, um, the Ukrainian Jewish refugee movement in the 1920s, and I sat and waited, and waited in the big reading room at the archives when the back door opened, because you usually get a file when you ask for it. Back door opens and there's a, a trolley with four big boxes on them. Yeah, uh, could be somebody transporting archival material. And it stopped at my desk and said, here's your, your file on Jewish refugees. And so I opened up the boxes and they were full of letters, yellow, yellowing, faded, falling apart letters, from Jews in Europe, desperate to get out of Europe, sending applications, requests, pleas to the Canadian government and to various Jewish organizations in Canada, asking for admission. There were thousands of them. And so you got to begin somewhere. And I picked up one of the letters. And it, like most of them, it had a picture of the family, um, handsome husband, a father, two children, mother, um, asking for admission. And it was, for me, reading it, a traumatic event. Because once I read it, and once I read the Canadian response, um, I was determined to get these people. And the letter was from a, a Dr. Stein, Jacob and Cecilia Stein, uh, wealthy Jews in Frankfurt. Father had fought in the First World War for the German army. Um, and they were a respected family. And of course, uh, after Kristallnacht, they had become refugees in their own country. They escaped to Vienna, uh, which was no, not much better. But they wrote this letter. And the letter reads, uh, gentlemen in great distress and need a refugee family addresses itself to you for help and rescue. We are in distress here without any possibility of earning a living. Our distress, particularly that of our children, a nine-year-old boy and a seven-year-old girl, increased daily, and there is nothing left for us but suicide. In our desperation, we appeal to you for permission to enter your country. There are surely people left in this world, people who will have pity on us, people who will save us. You are our last hope. Please do not let our cry for help go unheeded. We need help. We are drowning. No one is listening. Please rescue us before it is too late. Signed, Jacob and Cecilia Stein. This letter is simply an example of the thousands of letters that poured into the offices of various Jewish organizations of Canada, as well as into the offices of Canada's Bureau of Immigration, from Jews beside themselves with fear, begging to be allowed into Canada. And think about it. What a contribution these people would have made to Canada. There were letters from scientists, surgeons, Farmers, professors, industrialists, teachers, skilled craftsmen, bankers, merchants. Allowed into Canada, these people would have given Canada the best of European society and culture. Even from a selfish point of view, Canada should have grabbed these people because where else could we get immigrants of such quality? This was the cream of European society this was unlike any immigrant group that had ever come to Canada before. Alas, these people were Jews, 
and without a cabinet order in council, Jews were not permitted into Canada in these years. And to each of these letters seeking permission to enter, the response was the same. Appended to the letter was a small note from the immigration authorities in Canada, <clears throat> which said, unfortunately, though we greatly sympathize with your circumstances, at present the Canadian government is not admitting Jews. Please try some other country. And of course, for the millions of Jacob and Cecilia Stein, there was no other country. Well, that was the beginning of the hunt for us. Once we read that, uh, we knew there was a story. And that story took us to archives and across the world and interviews and um, meetings with Canadian officials. And it was very easy at that time to meet Canadian immigration officials because they didn't know the story. So when I went to talk to them, they thought I was coming to talk about how open Canada had been and how receptive and um, how comforting. And uh, when I confronted them with these things, uh, the story, they either didn't know it or pretended they didn't know it, um, and um, said something to the effect, uh, which proved to be very true, that Jews were marginal after all. Uh, there was not an interest of Canadians at the time. We were worried about the war, worried about the Depression, and so it was only a couple of people who made these decisions to keep Jews up. Uh, but because no one knew the story, every, every source was available. I even remember going to the Department of Immigration warehouse, because I thought this was a good story. Um, and they put, brought out boxes and boxes of materials, which were quite incriminating and quite devastating. Um, they hadn't looked at. Um, and we, that's how we got our information. But the key was, what Canada was like in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. The Canada of the 1930s and 40s was a country permeated with anti-Semitism, with racism, with, <clears throat> with xenophobia. And you know, the best story I use often in talking about anti-Semitism in Canada is the story of Samuel Rabinovich, who if you don't know this story, it's something you should <clears throat> remember. Rabinovich, Young Rabinovich was a uh, medical student at the University of Montreal, graduated first in his class, probably the most brilliant student they had, and he was hired as an intern at Notre Dame Hospital in Montreal and went to work, and the day he began work, every single intern at every single Catholic hospital went out on strike, refusing to work with a, a, a Jewish doctor, and the interns were supported by the government, by the uh, media, by the various Quebec newspapers, by the church, by Quebec nationalists. Um, it was a scandalous event. I'm a labor historian by training, and it was the most bizarre strike that I've ever written about or read about in Canadian history. And it lasted for a week. It was headlines, the like, like, like Grave Days in turn, the strike of the interns, front page stories, mostly told sympathetically about the interns. Um, they forsaking their newly sworn Hippocratic oath, refused to accept patients. And this went on for most of a week until Rabinovich resigned. Um, the hospital promised never again to hire a Jewish doctor, a promise it kept until the 1980s. And Rabinovich did what most young Jewish students um, motivated, had to do in the 1920s and 30s in Canada, emigrate to the United States, which is where Rabinovich plays out his role as a prominent physician, specialist in uh, kidney diseases at the University of Pennsylvania, becomes world famous. A contribution he makes in the United States rather than in Canada. This event was one of the many that hallmarked the anti-Semitism in this country in the 1920s and 30s, but they were far worse. Again, if you, if you don't know the story of, of perhaps the worst 
anti-Semitic event in Canadian history. It's become the folklore, at least, of the Toronto Jewish community. And that is the riot at Christie Pitts. Um, if you know Toronto, Christie Pitts is near Bathurst and, and Bloor. And in 1933, in August of 1933, uh, there was a riot that broke out between a Jewish baseball team and um, hundreds of youth who had arrived bearing swastikas attacked them. It was a battle that went on for most of the night. Um, it was the worst anti-Jewish <clears throat> Jewish violence in Canadian history, far, uh, far worse than anything that ever happened in Quebec. Uh, masses outpouring of police and on horses, motorcycles armed with clubs and nightsticks. Um, as Jewish reinforcements arrived from the college in Spadina area to take on the, the bullies who had arrived from the beaches in Toronto, and it was a, um, a veritable riot. And what this, it didn't amount to much in terms of casualties. There were some broken heads, broken arms, um, and some arrests. Um, but the, the most important aspect of it was that it signaled that there was something wrong with race relations in Canada. Clearly, Toronto Jews were, were responding to years of discrimination, abuse, insults, and injuries. For them, the riot was a catharsis, a symbolic act of defiance. For once, they had stood up and fought back against their oppressors, which is why this becomes part of the folklore of the community. So anybody in Toronto who was alive in the 1930s, even though they'd just been born, was part of the Christie Pitts riots. So when we would interview people about anti-Semitism in, in Toronto and, and um, uh, elsewhere, the, they always came back to, oh yes, I remember the Christie Pitts riot, I was there, blah, blah, blah. So um, it, it has just become an important element in the history of, of Toronto Jewry. Um, it didn't make a difference. The abuse, the discrimination, the insults, and the injuries would continue unabated, um, not only in Toronto, but there were demonstrations, confrontations in the street of, streets of Winnipeg and, and Vancouver and, and other cities uh, where bullied Jews and anti-Semitic gangs uh, would battle one another. Um, what's important to remember, and what we didn't realize when we were writing None is Too Many, is the the um, blanketing impact, the blanketing effect of anti-Semitism in this country. This was not Nazi Germany. This was not Europe. This was Canada. And in this country in the 1920s and 30s, there were quotas and there were restrictions um, which became a way of life for Jews. Um, there were reports commissioned by the Canadian Jewish Congress which showed that, that financial institutions, banks, large industrial and commercial interests excluded Jews from employment. Department stores did not hire Jews as salespeople. Jews could work in the back rooms, they could work in the department store factories, but were not allowed to become salespeople. Uh, Jewish doctors, as we just heard, were not allowed doctors of uh, hospital appointments. Um, not only did universities and professional schools devise quotas against Jewish students, there was not one single professor in this country in the 1920s and 30s at a time when tens of thousands of Jewish German academics were forced to leave and were looking for jobs and were accepted and welcomed by many other countries and not Canada. Um, and don't forget this was a time in, in Quebec, uh, not French Canada, but English Canada, when McGill kept raising its standards for Jewish admission. Um, and the, high, the low light was the admission by the Dean of Arts, um, who was the longest serving Dean of Arts at McGill, that we should, even, um, we should even strengthen these restrictions against Jews because as he told the president of McGill, the principal of McGill, Jews serve no useful purpose in this country. So that's what the Jews were confronting in Canada in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, if it was difficult to get employment, it was equally difficult to find a place to live. Uh, this was a period of restrictive covenants, which kept Jews at a vast swath of, of homes and, 
in potential uh, places to live in this country. Um, there were signs uh, uh, banning Jews from various beaches, hotels. It was difficult for Jews to find a place to, to vacation. Um, uh, there were restrictive covenants and, and restrictions on hotels, so it was very difficult for the Jews to find any place in the Laurentians, no place in Muskoka, um, no tennis courts, no golf clubs. Um, it was um, a vastly difficult time for Canada's Jews. Um, and it was also a time of some violence. The question we tried to answer, or at least I tried to think about, was why was Canada so anti-Semitic? Uh, to some extent, it had to do with propaganda. Uh, radio was a recent discovery, and uh, the radio um, waves were full of anti-Semitic uh, polemicists like Henry Ford and Father Coughlin. Um, this was a time of economic depression, and the search for a scapegoat invariably ended up on a Jewish doorstep. Um, the prominence of Jewish names and left-wing movements also convinced many of the gullible and the antipathetic uh, that Jews were communists, that all Jews were communists. In addition, many Canadians were reacting to three decades of almost unlimited immigration um, and the rapid rise of anti-Semitism, of nativism, of xenophobia in Canada in the 20s and 30s came out of a concern over the type of Canada these millions of largely uneducated, illiterate aliens would produce. For, Jew for many of these people, Jews represented the mongrelization of this country. And for them, anti-Semitism was simply another form of Canadian nationalism. If you cared about your country, if you cared about its future, um, then you didn't want Jews. It was clear as that. Um, in Quebec um, and in fundamentalist areas of Western Canada, uh, anti-Semitism or, uh, originated from religious teachings. Jews, churchgoers were told, had killed Christ had refused to repent or convert to Christianity, and therefore were doomed. Also, non-Jewish immigrants, particularly from Eastern Europe, brought with them um, anti-Semitism as part of their, their cultural baggage. Uh, generations of anti-Jewish tradition could not be forgotten overnight. There, were two th there was one reason, I think, that stood out above all else. Many Canadians, especially the elite, are chattering classes, opinion makers, academics, writers, journalists, continue to believe through the 1930s, through the 1940s, that Jews did not fit their concept of Canada. Their Canada was a Canada of homesteaders, of farmers, and few Canadians believed that Jews could make successful agriculturalists despite their success in Palestine in turning deserts green. And those immigrants who did not farm were expected to go into the woods and the mines and the smelters and then the canneries, textile mills, join the construction crews in the north to fuel the great Canadian boom which had disappeared. Jews were seen as city people, as peddlers, as shopkeepers in a country that wanted loggers and miners. They were seen as people with brains in a country that preferred people with brawn. They were seen as people with strong minds in a country that wanted people with strong backs. The unfortunate thing about all of this for the Jews of Europe is that anti-Semitism had seeped into the highest levels of the Canadian government. I'm not going to go through none as too many, uh, except to point out that there was an unholy triumvirate of three individuals who made sure Jews would not come to this country. We didn't know this. Nobody knew of, of the anti-Semitism that pervaded internal Canadian politics. Uh, nobody knew how, um, how xenophobic and anti-Semitic these people were. Um, firstly, of course, Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister of Canada, was obsessed with Jews. He wrote about them constantly, filled his diary with 
with thoughts about Jews, and his diary is a unique document because King wrote about everything and he kept records of everything, so there are thousands and thousands of pages of his own meandering thoughts about everything from bowel movements to his dog to his mother um, to his seances to talk to um, great, great world heroes like Thomas Jefferson and the Duke of Wellington to make sure that his policies are right. But he wrote about Jews. And he said about Jews that they were people of the book, they were mystical, but he was also capable of believing and repeating the most bilious anti-Semitic slander. Um, he convinced himself that allowing Jews into Canada, even of the best type, he said, would destroy the country. Um, as he wrote in his diary, but as he told his cabinet, we must keep Canada free from unrest and too great an intermixture of foreign strains of blood. He believed, and he said, and this is directly from his thoughts, that Jews would pollute Canada's bloodstream, whatever that means, but he believed it, that accepting Jewish refugees would undermine Canadian unity, would cause riots in the street, would exacerbate relations between the federal government and the provinces, would strengthen the forces of, of separatism in Quebec, and would destroy Canada. He believed it. Um, the bug in, uh, about allowing Jews into Canada was kept in his ear by his Quebec lieutenant, Ernest Lapointe, who also violently opposed Jewish immigration in Canada. The actual policy was carried out by his own minist deputy minister of immigration, Blair, uh, Frederick Blair, um, who said that Jews destroyed whatever country they were admitted to, and um, he was working desperately day and night to make, Jews, to make sure that Jews did not get into this country. Um, he headed a small department, but he sat in his office day and night. On weekends, he said, because he was afraid that some Jews would slip through an, an unwitting official. And of course, the final member of this triumvirate was a guy that surprised us the most because he was honored by the Jewish community, um, a great Canadian hero, Vincent Massey, who was our um, ambassador to London, our high commissioner, but also in charge of European immigration and worked as hard as he could to keep Jews out of the country. Um, he would substitute others, uh, Sudeten Germans, for example, uh, instead of, of allowing in Jews. So um, the Canadian government um, simply reflected the views of the Canadian people. King was the most successful politician we've ever had in this country, a long-serving prime minister. And I think had he believed for a second that allowing Jews into Canada would have won him some votes. He probably would have. But he knew that it didn't, so he didn't. Allowing Jews into Canada was a guaranteed loser of votes, and so Mackenzie King and his government, to the very end, closed Canada's doors as tightly as, as possible. And even when the war begins, um, and there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews who escape from Germany, make their way to the Low Countries, to France, Holland, and later to Spain and Portugal. Of these people, many of whom had skills we desperately needed, had capital, we, in the years between 1939 uh, 39 and 45, accepted only a few hundred. Um, and, and the research for us was terrifying because we never, we never knew what to, what to, what to expect. Um, we found uh, perhaps the worst story was the treatment of the Canadian government of Jewish children. Um, there was the incident in France, Vichy France, when the Vichy government was put under pressure by the Nazis to begin deporting to the camps children. Um, their parents had already been deported east, and now the, fr the Germans wanted children between the age of six months and ten years, and the Vichy government at that time was not yet prepared uh, 
to send children to their deaths. And so they asked the Americans and the Canadians if they would accept 10,000, 5,000 each of these children. And the Americans accepted. And uh, on behalf of Canada, the Canadian Jewish Congress chartered some boats from Portugal, neutral country, to bring over these children and went across the country recruiting foster homes and arranging for schooling for these children. But the issue sat in cabinet. And the problem was the minister, deputy minister of immigration and the minister of immigration argued that how do we know these children are, are, refuge, are orphans? Um, we don't accept orphans unless we know for sure their parents are dead. Um, and what we, would Canada become, if not a laughing stock, if after the war, these children who were orphans turned around and sponsored their parents as immigrants? And the other reason they said they wouldn't accept these children was because it was Canada's policy to accept only family units. So if they could bring their parents with, then we might accept them. And that was why we rejected, or we delayed responding until it was too late. And all of these children were deported to Auschwitz and Gaz. Not one of them survived. Um, so during the war, there were public opinion polls taken in Canada, uh, which we didn't know about, uh, which had never been reported because they were in uh, the war cabinet files which indicated increasing anti-Semitism throughout this period. Um, the government knew it, and that explains their policy. You know, the, the, the Canadian government always did what the British and Americans asked of them, except for one instance. That was when the Americans, who were feeling a little bit uncomfortable about what was happening to the Jews of Europe, wanted to hold a conference on what to do, and chose Ottawa, unsuspecting Ottawa, as a place for that conference where people would congregate and talk about how to rescue the Jews of Europe. Uh, Mackenzie King panicked, uh, didn't want the conference in Ottawa, was afraid that if the conference were held in Ottawa, um, the spotlight would be turned on Canada's policy. And so he refused. First time and only time that I can find that he refused the British and the Americans in the Second World War, and the conference was held in Bermuda, and Canada never bothered attending. So um, even the war made no difference, and, you know, and after the war, um, things didn't get better. One would have thought that after the war, when people saw in their newsreels and in the magazines like Look and Life, um, the survivors, what had happened to them, the pictures of the camps, that there would be a spontaneous sympathy with um, the Jewish community. The exact opposite happened. What we now see uh, from the public opinion polls after the end of the war, that for three years, the polls indicating a growth of anti-Semitism grow almost exponentially. People who argue that anti-Semitism ended because of Holocaust are wrong because anti-Semitism goes up every year until 1948. And meanwhile, the Canadian government is booming. Uh, there is a great need of manpower. We're providing the wherewithal for European survival. We need, desperately need people. We send immigrant, immigration authorities into the camps and they're told to bring over as many as they can with the exception of Jews. So even after the war, until 1948, the order goes out, no Jews, and even when there's a scheme for Jews to bring in tailors, garment workers, um, just before the immigration authorities go into the, war, into the camps, uh, the government says, well, okay, you can bring in Jews, but for every Jew you bring in, you have to bring in a non-Jew. So that cuts the program in half, and it's difficult to find non-Jewish garment workers. Uh, when did Canada open its doors? Uh, in 1948, when did anti-Semitism begin to recede? In 1948. And the reason why both happened is one word, Israel. The creation of a Jewish state meant 
that Canada would not be flooded by Jews. Jews had somewhere to go. They would not all come to Canada. And it was only with the creation of a Jewish state, with partition, that the government begins to send authorities into the camps and begins recruiting the best possible, at least from their point of view, um, immigrants. Um, also, why does anti-Semitism recede? Because Israel provides a new stereotype. The stereotype of the Jew in Canada, throughout most of the world, was a typical peddler, or emaciated Holocaust survivor. But that's replaced in 1947 and 48 by the Sabra, the, the Israeli fighter, brave, courageous, who had withstood invading Arab armies. Um, and this gives um, the Jewish community the, 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 um, the support they needed. Um, the creation of the Jewish state means that there are uh, people now who are sympathetic. Um, world doesn't like a loser. Jews are now winners. And I think that's what provides um, the beginning of the end, the inexorable decline of anti-Semitism in Canada. And finally, in 48, Canada opens its doors to refugees. And we have the distinction of probably having, outside of Israel, per capita, the greatest acceptance of admission of Holocaust refugees of, of any country or Holocaust survivors of any country in the world. So that's the historical shorthand uh, of the story told in None is Too Many. It's a story, as we discovered, of a scarcely recognizable Canada. The Canada of the first half of the 20th century was a country that was benighted and closed and xenophobic in which minorities were barred from almost every sector of Canadian life. It was a Canada, as you heard, whose immigration policies were racist and exclusionary, a country blanketed by an oppressive anti-Semitism in which Jews were the pariah of Canadian society, demeaned, despised, discriminated against. Um, today's Canada, far different. We're generous, we're open, we're decent, we're humane. Multiculturalism is now an integral part of Canadian policy. Diversity is encouraged. Yet at a moment when intolerance seems to be the global growth industry of the new century, the lessons of none is too many, as Shimon stole from me, <coughs> describing a, a shameful period of, of, um, of Canadian history, should not be ignored. Immigration refu and refugee policies still divide Canadians. There remains a significant pocket of discrimination and racism, perhaps less so of, of anti-Semitism. Nazi war criminals and collaborators, thousands of whom were welcomed into the country immediately after the war, still live freely amongst us. So clearly we have much left to learn from our checkered past. Uh, none is, the success of None is Too Many shocked us. We, you know, when we wrote the book, we thought it would appear, tell its story, and disappear. Who was going to buy a book with 40 pages of footnotes? Well, uh, we were wrong. None is Too Many took on a life of its own. Um, it was a bestseller. It was on the Maclean's bestseller list, the Globe and Mail bestseller list for four or five months. Um, which in Canada doesn't say much because it didn't mean much in sales, but it was still indicative that, that people outside of the academic community were reading it. Um, we thought it would never have more than a, um, a marginal place in, in historiography, describing a disturbing piece of history about a shameful period of, of Canada's past. And instead, I think to conclude, I, None is too many has become a, an ethical yardstick against which contemporaneous government policies are gauged. Uh, we take pride that our book is often cited in debates over uh, refugee and immigration policy and, and is often credited with making these policies more humane. And particularly we take pride, as Shimon pointed out, in, our, in the role that None is too many played in convincing the Minister of Immigration
to open up Canada's doors to the Vietnamese boat people. And again, we had the largest per capita acceptance of Vietnamese boat people probably in the world. And the one quote that Ron Atke, who was the Minister of Immigration, made that resounds was that he did not want to be the Frederick Blair of the 1980s. And that's why Canada opened his doors. Finally, though we had the worst record of any Western nation, of any immigration country, Canada, remember, was not alone. While Canadian soldiers were fighting heroically to defeat the Nazis, their government, among, along with others, behaved with a calculated and tragic indifference to the plight of the Jews. And I think one fact transcends all others. The Jews of Europe were not so much trapped in a whirlwind of systematic mass murder as they were abandoned to it. The Nazis planned and executed the Holocaust, but it was made possible by an indifference to the suffering of the victims which bordered on contempt. Not one nation showed generosity of spirit to those who were doomed. Not one made the Jewish plight a national priority. And not one willingly opened its doors after the war to the surviving remnant of a once thriving, vibrant European Jewish community. The nations of the world, including our Canada, were put to the test of civilization, and they failed. And so finally, we must resolve that as Canadians, we never al ever allow that to happen again. That, I suppose, is the lesson of the book. A lesson I'm glad to understand, to, to uh, uh, say that Canada seems to have taken to heart over the past generation, that never again for anyone at any time should none be too many. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.